This meeting is being recorded. Good morning, everyone. We'll wait a few seconds while the uh, waiting room populates or the Zoom room populates. All right, good morning and welcome to this meeting on the Committee on the Revision of the Penal Code, which is now in session. I'm Mike Romano, Committee Chair. Um, first off, I'd like to begin by announcing that Assembler Member Isaac Bryan was appointed to the committee to fill uh, by Speaker Rendon uh, to fill Assembly Member Lee's position on the committee. Assembly Member Bryan represents the 54th Assembly District in Los Angeles. Unfortunately, Assembly Member Bryan could not be with us today on such short notice, but we look forward to working. Uh, with him and his staff. And we are, of course, grateful for Assembly Member Lee's contributions during his time on the committee, uh, during his time on this committee. So, uh, as I said, I look forward to working with Assembly Member Brian and his staff. Let's begin with a quick roll call. Uh, Judge Espinoza? Present. Judge Henderson? Present. Justice Moreno? Uh, present. Uh, Senator Skinner? Here. And uh, Assembly, Brian, Assembly Member Brian is not able to join us today. Uh, today, we have a packed agenda with a total of 22 committee witnesses. We're here to discuss bail, pretrial release, and related matters. We all know this issue is one of the most complicated and fraud in California law. I think that makes it a perfect opportunity for this committee. We'll also take a couple of breaks along the way, including lunch around 1 p.m. Tomorrow, we'll discuss what we heard today and follow up on issues from previous committee hearings and then vote on recommendations to make this year. We'll also hear public comment both at the end of today's hearing and tomorrow before we will vote on recommendations to include in our annual report. Our topic today is bail and pretrial release. The issue potentially affects more than 700,000 adults who are arrested in California each year. And right now there are more than 40,000 people in jails throughout California who are on pretrial status awaiting resolution of their case. It's an understatement to say that our meeting today is not the first time this issue has been considered in California. Between the major working group created by the Chief Justice, landmark legislation in the form of SB 10 and its equally unprecedented repeal by referendum, and the California Supreme Court's decision in Humphrey in March 2021, which forbid holding someone pre-trial solely because they can't afford cash bail, our state has tried to make the system better. And most recently, Two federal district court judges have also declared that some uses of bail schedules, which list how much money someone needs to pay to get out of jail following arrest, are unconstitutional because they discriminate against people without the ability to put up large sums of money. A large focus of today's meeting will be what effect those efforts have had. For those who have followed this issue closely, a lot of what we hear today may trigger a sense of deja vu. We, but we do have new information and new data, including some presented here for the first time on our current state of affairs in California. We also have results from other jurisdictions, including New Jersey, New York, and Houston, Texas. These results show that increasing the number of people released on pretrial release can be done in large numbers, humanely, and in a way that actually improves public safety. For example, Two years after New Jersey implemented major reform to their pretrial release system, both the trail, jail prop population reduced and crime rates dropped precipitously, with robberies, burglaries, and homicides all dropping by one third. We'll hear about that experience today, along with what people across California have to say about how the state should change or not change its current system. I expect we'll hear that there's a lot of confusion across the board about how bail and other pretrial determinations are made under current California law. And I look forward to discussing concrete ideas for solutions to these important issues. So that's where we're starting. Um, our first speaker today is a presentation from Michelle Paris, who's program director at the Vera Institute of Justice. And she's here to talk about information about the pretrial population in Los Angeles County jail system. Ms. Paris will give us a few minutes of data and then we'll have a, a brief Q&A session. Hi, Ms. Paris, welcome to the committee. Good morning, thank you so much for having me. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, 
Wonderful. Um, thank you, Tommy, for um, operating the slides for me today. Good morning, everyone. Um, as was noted, I'm a program director at the Vera Institute of Justice. If you can go to the next slide, please. So um, just a little bit about me and Vera. Vera is a national nonprofit, for those of you not familiar, that harnesses data analysis, research, policy and advocacy to end mass incarceration, combat racial injustice, and build stronger and healthier communities. My program focuses specifically on doing that work in the state of California. So as was noted today, I'm gonna to talk about data on money bail and the LA County jail system. Next slide, please. So, Thank you. So as many of you know, LA County has the largest jail system in the country. As of yesterday, there were 14,895 people incarcerated across the seven facilities in the LA County jail system. For context, pre-pandemic, it was around 17,000. As you can see here, pretrial incarceration is a driver of the jail population. So on any given day, nearly 7,000 people are in jail, not because they're a danger to the community, but largely because of an inability to pay bail. This data is available on our Care First LA data dashboard, which is fed by documents that the Sheriff's Department posts daily. Um, the mental health information is posted weekly. And once I finish my presentation, or perhaps Chris, my colleague who's on, who ran this data, um, can put a link in the chat to this dashboard um, and you're able to access information on the pretrial population and many other populations in the jail. Next slide, please. So in April 2020, at the onset of the pandemic, the California Judicial Council, as many of you know, passed Emergency Rule 4, colloquially known as Zero Dollar Bail, um, which was a schedule that recommended judges set zero dollar bail in low level misdemeanor and felony cases statewide so that public safety, not wealth, underpinned release or detention decisions. After implementation of Emergency Rule 4, that's the right slide, thank you. The LA County pretrial population decreased by 18% in a month. And that was the single largest decline in the county's overcrowded jail system in years. This progress, as you can see, if you look to the right of this chart has basically disappeared, particularly since the state and local court eliminated zero bail and we are dangerously close to pre-pandemic levels of pretrial incarceration now. I'll just note this is particularly troubling given that 55 people died in the jails last year, the highest number since 2013. And there's also ongoing litigation on behalf of people in jail pretrial who were suffering with overcrowding, life-threatening conditions and inexcusable delays in case processing. A federal judge recently ordered the county to address those conditions immediately and, in fact, to explain what role alternatives to incarceration could actually play in addressing them. Next slide, please. So I know this information has probably been shared by this committee um, in the past, and unfortunately, it hasn't really changed much. There are clear disparities, racial disparities in incarceration in L.A. County, particularly for Black people who are 8% of L.A. County and 29% of people in the jails. This happens obviously at multiple points in the system, starting at arrest, and the use of money bail disproportionately impacts and compounds those disparities. Next slide, please. So if Assembly Member Brian were here today, he would probably be familiar with this because I believe he worked on this study and the committee has referenced UCLA's million dollar hoods and their work. Um, I believe in this memo and, and before. This is a study from Million Dollar Hoods of 2017 LAPD bookings data that showed that there was a total of over $3.6 million levied in money bail over the course of a year. People who used a bail bond agent paid an estimated 40 million in non-refundable bail bond deposits. And they found that the financial toll for pretrial release, not surprisingly, largely impacts Black and Latinx people in the most economically aggrieved communities in the city of LA. Next slide, please. So historically, we've heard of bail amounts in California being high. Um, in 2015, PPIC released information that said that the median bail in California was 50,000, um, more than five times the median in the rest of the nation, which was under 10,000. We um, are largely basing our analysis today on a snapshot of everyone incarcerated on May 4th, 2022, so this year. Um, and based on that snapshot, that is still the case. So the median bail amount is $235,000 and the mean is over a million dollars. And just for comparison, this is four times higher than the median bail amount for people held in the New York City jail system. And they have comparable percentages of people in jail for violent felonies, nonviolent felonies, and lower level offenses. Next slide, please. 
So racial disparities exist even within the high bail amounts. So when controlling for charged level, bail amounts for Black and Latinx people were often higher than for other races, particularly for felonies, which are what most people in the seven jail facilities pretrial are charged with. So you can see from this chart that for the people charged with felonies on the right two columns, the red bars, which represent the median bail amount, are generally the longest for Black or Hispanic um, or Latinx people. Next slide, please. Thank you. So the LA Superior Court uses misdemeanor and felony bail schedule amounts to recommend bail amounts by charge. Um, as many of you know, judges have the discretion to depart from the schedule of bail amount if a person has a prior criminal record or other so-called aggravating factors exist. There isn't any way to track in our snapshot data if judicial discretion was exercised to depart from the schedule, but out of 748 people charged with only a single count of a single offense, 73% had bail amounts that were greater than the bail schedule recommendation. So in this chart, you'll see of those 748 people, how far above the recommended bail amount those um, bails were actually set at. Next slide, please. So the length of time that people remain in jail pretrial is another driver of LA County's ballooning jail population. For people incarcerated pretrial with bail set, the median number of days in custody was almost three months, so 84 days, and nearly one in five um, people pre-trial with bail set had been in jail for over a year. Next slide, please. So as I noted earlier, most people in the jail pre-trial faced felony charges. We don't know where their cases ended up, so the charges that we have are the booking charges. Of those, 70% were serious or violent felonies, 23% were non-serious, non-violent felonies, and 6.2% were misdemeanors. And I want to emphasize here that you're seeing a very particular slice of the universe of incarceration in LA County because this focuses on people in the seven jails on a particular day. It doesn't capture the people booked and released within days from local lockups or the jail system who often face lower level charges like possession of a controlled substance or driving on a suspended license, um, supervision violations, et cetera. Um, as I've noted here, robust research has found that even 23 hours in jail has a quote unquote criminogenic effect that negatively impacts a person's housing job and overall security such that they're statistically more likely to be arrested again in the future as a result of incarceration. Um, and I believe some of that research is cited in the memo that was provided to you all today from the committee. Next slide, please. Um, and then, you know, just one more note. While people um, held on unaffordable bail amounts are the, that's the biggest driver of pretrial incarceration, hundreds of people were essentially remanded to custody for the entire duration of their cases, um, as judges had set, quote unquote, no bail. So on May 4th, 2022, 905 people, so 15% of the pretrial population, were remanded without bail and had no other holds, including 349 who were facing relatively uh, low-level felony and misdemeanor charges. Next slide, please. So um, as I noted earlier, this is a, a limited picture based on available data. We know that you know we wish constantly that we had much more information about the use of money bail. We would love it if we had access to admission and release cohort data sets in addition to the snapshot to kind of get a more accurate picture of pretrial incarceration. We'd know more about actual length of stay, um, how bail amounts are set, um, but we don't have access to that type of data. We would also really benefit from the courts collaborating with counties to track information about judicial decisions, including things like bail deviation, which are essentially um, a black box to many of us um, working on the outside and arraignment decisions, like how many people have been released on their own recognizance versus sent to pretrial services um, versus things like electronic monitoring. And um, in case you're looking for examples, there are um, examples of more robust data collection and publication in places like New Jersey and New York, which publish information down to you know courthouse and sometimes even judges. And so um, it would be great if we had some more robust access to data um, and it would particularly help those of us working on the local level. And um, if you go to the next slide, the information, my contact information is here, as well as that for my colleague, Chris Kaiser-Nyman, who's on, who um, produced the data analysis. So 
thank you all for, for listening. Thank you very much. That was super interesting. Um, I have a few questions, but I was curious if other committee members had thoughts first before I go. Yes, yeah, Senator Skinner. Um, I might not have been fully tracking, but how much of that data is based on California specifically? So that the the initial data that's provided is from LA County. It's produced by the Sheriff's Department on a daily basis about the jail population. When I got more granular about the bail amounts, that was specifically a snapshot, a one day snapshot of everyone incarcerated in the LA County jail system okay. on May, 5th, May 4th of this year. So it's all specific to LA County, which is where I'm based. And right. um, it's worked through our Jail Population Review Council, which has sort of granular data from the Sheriff's Department. Okay, so we don't really have data about around the rest of California to know whether this is um, comparable or anomalous. So um, I, I, we don't generally have that type of data. It's really hard to come by. I will say there are certain pieces of that picture that I know that the committee uh, memo started to address, which were the variations in the bail schedule amounts for certain charges. Um, there's a chart, I believe, in the memo, but sort of granular daily data like that or snapshots, um, we haven't really had access to in any other place. Okay. Uh, quick, quick question. This is uh, Justice Moreno. Uh, great presentation, uh, Michelle. You know, what are the three salient factors you think that cause, if there is a cause and effect, uh, as to why the number of people in pretrial custody seem, seem very high. And I assume they're very high compared to New Jersey and New York, as you've kind of alluded to. But what are the three things, the three reasons? Is it the judges? Is it the DAs? Is it the, the criminal justice culture here in uh, LA County? Uh, I mean, what is it? If you had to say, these are the three things I would really like to dig into. Yeah, so um, the first are, I think, um, what I tried to hit home are the sort of astronomical bail amounts that are different than okay. other jurisdictions. I think a lot of people who are coming through the system just plain and simple can't afford those. And right. even though litigation like Humphrey attempted to sort of disrupt that, we're still yeah. in a system where there's unaffordable money bail. Um, I think we don't know that it's that judges are setting, you know, the racial disparities that we see, we don't know that those are because of how judges are setting bail, but mm -hmm. it also could be that, you know, the, the white people who come to the system, for example, have more access to resources and are able to get out. And so right. these are the people who are left behind. So wealth is obviously still a huge factor. One of the things that we're also trying to create in LA County is an independent pretrial services system that is community-based and that provides an alternative to money bail for judges. So I think right now we don't really have, um, we don't have a countywide system that offers an alternative where a pretrial services entity would say, judge, we're gonna connect people to services. We're gonna provide text reminders. Don't worry about this, we've got this. We'll help them get back to court. And we don't have that in LA County. That's something that exists in a lot of other jurisdictions like New York City that have also implemented these kinds of pretrial reforms. So I would say that's another um, big factor in LA County. And what, what about with respect to the judges on the clear and convincing standard? Uh, are they not, are they applying a lesser standard in terms of not applying Humphrey? So I can't speak to that. I think that would actually be probably better for practitioners who are practicing in LA County. I'd say it's pretty clear that people are still in on unaffordable bail. We hear a lot of anecdotes about um, inconsistent implementation of mm -hmm. those analyses, but I think it would be better to ask probably current practitioners. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I have a question, Michelle. A few years ago, the federal courts uh, ordered a dramatic uh, reduction in the state's prison population. And Governor Brown adopted a program which essentially diverted people who would go to prison to the county jails. Do you have any sense of, so that what we have now, as I understand it, are people going to the jails who would previously have been going to our prisons. Do you have any sense of how that might affect the bail numbers here, bail higher and those kinds of things? So I don't think we have any indication that the sort of charges coming through um, the system mm -hmm. have changed significantly over the years. Mm -hmm. um, and again, our data shows booking charges. So we actually don't know 
you know, what ends up happening to those folks? Are those AB 109 folks? Do they go to prison? Are they, you know, getting probation? We can't really see that in our data. And we were very laser focused on the pretrial population, particularly people with bail set and who didn't have holds, who are very ripe to get out of jail. <laughs> like yeah. the only barrier is really money. Um, I would say on the dashboard, and hopefully we'll put in the chat if we haven't yet, the, the link to it, you'll see um, we do have a tab for the AB 109 population. And that population has actually dropped significantly over the course of the pandemic. Um, and that's kind of stayed down. So that's been sort of an interesting development. But I don't know that that relates specifically to pretrial popula uh, the pretrial population or any recommendations that we would make around that. Yeah, OK. But right now, it looks like slightly under 50% who are in county jail are there in pretrial custody. I mean, 7,000 out of 15,000. That's 15, right. 000. I think it's 46% or something like that, yeah. So I have a question. So you've noted that, that 7,000, about 7,000 people in the LA County Jail are there because they can't afford bail. Um, and um, obviously what I think we're concerned about, what the courts are concerned about is people um, uh, being held on with money bail as a proxy for dangerousness, right? Not actually being held because, um, and I, we assume that that 7,000, it's not so much the bail amount, but is it right to assume that the, that's the, the premiums that are being charged by the bail, the 10% premium that they can't afford. So I guess my, my question is, um, one of the reforms that was suggested in our memo was to have court ordered bail um, bonds, meaning that instead of the, that allow courts to issue the bond, perhaps without any premium whatsoever, and saying, you know, your bail is $100,000. If you don't show up, you owe us $100,000, but otherwise you're free to go. Yeah, well, that's the federal system. There's no bail bondsman involved. You just sign the, like a promissory note and an agreement to pay uh, and no premium and everything exonerated once the matter's resolved. And so Ms. Paris is wondering if you have thoughts about that as a potential reform. So I, I know my colleague Insha, who's a, a national expert, is going to be speaking later. And I definitely would recommend asking her that question because I think she probably has a much more thoughtful answer than I do. I think that in general, there are a lot of people who can be released without money bail who are currently incarcerated, who could be released with text reminders, with minimal service referrals. And I think that is sort of like the first cut of folks that we would start to think about. Um, and I do think that in New York and other places, we do see different ways of doing bail bonds that aren't so dependent on the bail bond industry yeah. and this sort of premium. And I think New York is a great example of that. So Incha can definitely speak to that. And I think she'll have a much more thoughtful answer about what kind of scheme could actually work for California and what has she seen work best for folks. Yeah. You know, I, didn't, I didn't write this down, but uh, in in the those who are in pretrial custody for but have misdemeanors or the serious nonviolent felonies, I mean, what I, I didn't write down the numbers, uh, but what what are those numbers and what percent of those are uh, constitute uh, pretrial uh, uh, custody and uh, with uh, you know a trial pending. I mean, because so, there's one that the third category was like mm -hmm. the, the violent, serious, and that really drives up the mean. But as to the misdemeanor and the non serious uh, felony, how many of those were there in the? So section? the the um, the mean and the median, we narrowed in to people who were only pretrial. Right. And who have bail set and who do yeah. not have holds. So, again, we narrowed it in right. to people who are basically exclusively pending trial. So even folks with holds. You know, yeah. they have a sort of additional complexity. We excluded them and we kept it narrow in. So those are misdemeanor folks who have right. a, a, an open case. And then in our data, the sheriff's data, there's a category that you'll also see in one of my slides called partially sentenced. And those yeah. are people who have an open case and are also serving a sentence. Mm -hmm. Those yeah. are not included in our data right. because they're serving a sentence. So we've narrowed it really into those folks who are pending trial. Right, but if, if you say you took out the ones who have serious and violent felonies, we didn't. You don't have that. No, we. So our the data that we've been providing is pretrial bail set. Yeah. And of those folks, seventy percent have serious or violent felony charges. Twenty three percent have non serious non violent felony charges, and six point two percent have misdemeanor charges. Okay. And again, that's the universe of people who are stuck in the seven facilities, not the people who are in and out of local right. lockup, substations, and the jail. 
Well, that, 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 that answers my question. So 70% have some pretty serious charges. That's right. Yeah. So I'm re really focusing on the 30% then who, you know, uh, maybe don't pose a, a threat to public safety. Yeah, so I think um, I think it's it makes sense in some ways to um, think about how to address that thirty percent. I know that a lot of the local reforms are also addressing how people with serious and violent felonies charges can actually be released safe, safely and yeah. don't necessarily pose a danger. I know also there are a lot of um, important alternative to incarceration programs here that if we could get folks to those sooner. That would also help alleviate some of the jail overcrowding. So I think of things like the Office of Diversion and Reentry Housing, that you know serves as an alternative to incarceration for people with serious felonies with serious mental health conditions. That's a lot of people in our jail system. So yeah. even those charges, they may sound um, you know sort of scary on their face, but a lot of times they don't actually reflect um, the dangerousness and the ability to actually divert those people. Yeah, but the public outcry you see is when they're out, they're released, the, ser the serious and violent mental health, that's when the public gets really concerned. That yeah, and, and I think, custody. and, I, and I, I definitely understand that. And I think, you know, programs like ODR housing are a really good example to point to of how it can be done successfully without compromising safety and actually promoting right. longer term safety. Right. All right, um, I wanna keep us moving on track. Judge Espinoza, I'll give you the last question here. Thank you so much, Ms. Paris, this has been terrific. Full disclosure, I've worked extensively with Michelle and the Jail Population Review Council that I chaired before my retirement. But I just I want to just focus back on the racial disparities in the LA County jail population for a minute. You, you talked about the difference between the population in the county and the general population in the jail. But uh, my recollection is if you focus further on the mental health population in 40% of the jail, more than 40% of the jail, is populated with people who are in mental health housing, that percentage actually goes up for African-American uh, prisoners. Is that a fair statement? And do you have that number? I always ask you this Sorry. question. Yes, I'm, I'm going, I'm, I'm literally pulling up the last presentation we did to the Jail Population Review Council, which has that information that shows that um, Black people are overrepresented in the mental health population. So, um, Black people are 8% of the county, 29% of the jail, and nearly 40% of people in the mental health population. Um, and we also saw that during the pandemic, when everybody was, you know, sort of rushing to release folks um, in the name of, of public health and safety, that Black people were often left behind. Um, so in terms of the, the releases of the mental health population. So um, the disparities also exist uh, with respect to that. And, and in fact, the mental health population as a percentage of the entire population went from around 30% to 40% um, during the pandemic. So that, that was generally true of everyone in mental health housing. They just got left behind. Um, and uh, unfortunately, African-American folks in the jail are overrepresented in the mental health population. Thank you. Well, Ms. Paris, thank you so much. This is super helpful. Um, I assume that you'll make our, your slides available to everyone. Yes, and we also have a we'll also have a PDF summary of this bail information, and um, I'll you know leave our contact information in the chat in case anybody has additional questions. Terrific. Thank you so much to you and all the folks at Vera. As you know, we rely on you a lot, so this is very helpful. I appreciate it. All right. Um, moving, moving on this morning, our first panel, we're extremely lucky to hear from two distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, the first is Chief Justice Stuart Rabner, who's the Chief Justice of the New Jersey Supreme Court to talk about developments in his state. And then Erwin Chemerinsky, who's the Dean of UC Berkeley Law School. Chief Justice Rabner and Dean Chemerinsky will give us some perspective from their Supreme Courts on bail issue. We'll hear each for five minutes and then have a few minutes for question and answer. Chief Justice Ravner, we'll begin with you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to speak, and good morning to all of you. New Jersey's reform effort relating to pretrial release began in earnest in 2013, about nine years ago. So mindful of your time constraints, I'll try to give you the Cliff Notes version in, as you said, about five minutes. Prior to 2017, when a defendant was arrested and appeared in court, Judges set an amount of bail in the large majority of cases. And looking back over time, that generated two problems that I imagine you're quite familiar with. First, too many poor defendants who posed a minimal risk of danger or flight sat in jail too long pretrial 
because they couldn't post even modest amounts of bail. A study done of the county jail population in October of 2012, for example, revealed that 12% of defendants held, one in eight, were being held in custody because they couldn't post up to $2,500 bail, sometimes held for months on end at a great cost to the taxpayers and an even greater co cost, of course, to defendants. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, defendants accused of violent crime who presented a serious risk of danger, failure to appear, were eligible for bail because the state constitution guaranteed it. And those who had access to money and could make high bails were released, even if they posed a threat to witnesses and to the community. Fast forward to January 1st of 2017. As a result of a new statute and a constitutional amendment, New Jersey moved away from its heavy reliance on monetary bail. Today, we rely instead on objective risk assessment measures that help us assess the level of risk of danger and flight for each defendant. And that means that defendants who pose low or moderate levels of risk are largely released on conditions that judges impose, which are monitored by pretrial services officers. And consistent with the statute, they're released within 24 to 48 hours of their arrest. High-risk defendants who pose a substantial risk of flight or of danger are detained pretrial, and bail is still available as an option under the current law, but it's hardly used in the initial release decision. Today, it's imposed in less than one in a thousand cases. Let's talk a bit about the results from those changes. We've carefully tracked data under the new system so that we could monitor results, identify trends and problems, and share information with others. Part of our analysis involved comparing data under the prior system that relied on money bail with data from the current reform system. So we compared data for release decisions in 2014 and 2017, and we also updated the study of the jail population that I mentioned earlier to compare results from October 2012 to six years later in 2018. And here's what we saw in a nutshell. First, although critics had predicted a spike in crime, if large numbers of defendants were released without bail, that didn't happen. The studies instead showed that the rate of new criminal activity for defendants who were released remained low, with only a small increase of about 1% in indictable offenses. Second, defendants continued to appear in court at a high rate under the new system. Initially, the rate dropped a few percentage points from about 92% to 89%, and it has since increased to more than 90%. And by and large, defendants have not been fleeing. They miss one or more court appearances, but then return to court. And third, we saw a substantial drop in the pretrial jail population, which went from nearly 9,000 at the start of 2016 to about 5,000 inmates in early 2020, right before COVID, a drop of more than 40%. And the uptick in jail population since then is because of the court's inability to conduct criminal trials in person for long stretches during the first two years of the pandemic. How did we get to the point that we're at? Through a cooperative effort across all three branches of government, the involvement of key stakeholders from the start, meetings, many meetings with local officials, community groups, and extensive training for judges, prosecutors, and the defense bar. It's worth noting that New Jersey's reform effort began under a Republican governor, continued under a Democratic governor, and has had the support of five different attorneys general and acting attorneys general as well as the public defender since 2013. There's more work and more challenges that lie ahead to be sure. Even with thousands fewer black and Hispanic defendants held pretrial, racial disparity still exists in the overall prison population that requires the attention of all three branches. Plus there are sure to be more changes, more fine tuning of the statute in the years that lie ahead. But the sea change that we've seen in New Jersey's system of pretrial release means that large numbers of low-risk defendants are no longer being held in custody because they're too poor to make bail, that more defendants instead are being released on conditions and they're showing up in court at comparable rates to before and not committing new offenses at a notably higher rate. And although defendants are still being held pretrial, those individuals are ones who pose a substantial risk of danger, a substantial risk of failure to appear. And that's how the system was intended to work. Let me stop there. I'll be pleased to try to answer any questions that you may have.
I have a number of questions for you. It seems that you have remarkable results in New Jersey, but before I do, I want to invite Dean Chemerinsky to join the conversation. So hello, Dean. Um, if you could give us some perspective on what's going on in California, and then we'll have a conversation with the panel. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's really an honor and pleasure to talk with you. As you know so well, In Ray Humphrey was an enormously important decision we are to mail in California. But the reality is, it's made very little difference so far. I think this commission has an enormous opportunity to make a difference by making recommendations to make Humphrey a reality. As this commission knows so well, in California and across the country, detaining individuals who can't afford bail is a huge problem. It's estimated that in this country, about 500,000 individuals are detained each day waiting trial. About two thirds of those who are in jail across the country are awaiting trial. I think that the decision of the California Court of Appeal and then the California Supreme Court in Humphrey was meant to dramatically change this for California. As you know, Humphrey held that a defendant can't be incarcerated solely because of an inability to afford bail. In Justice Tino Cuellar's opinion for the court, California Supreme Court said, there must be clear and convincing evidence to show that detention is necessary to protect public safety or victim safety or assure a court appearance. And something I want to come back to, I think it's quite key that the California Supreme Court focused on both due process and equal protection, including under the United States Constitution as a basis for its decision. It explicitly rejected the argument that only the Eighth Amendment prohibition of excess of bail is relevant. But as you've heard and will hear, there's a very powerful study titled Coming Up Short, The Unrealized Promise of In Ray Humphrey. It shows there's no evidence that Humphrey has led to a net decrease in pretrial jail population in California. No evidence that Humphrey has resulted in a decrease in the medium bail amount. No evidence that Humphrey has resulted in a decrease in the average length of pretrial detention. But despite the majestic ruling of the California Supreme Court, little seems to have changed. So let me offer some suggestions that this commission might want to consider in ways to make the promise of Humphrey a reality. First, I think that the California Supreme Court and or the California legislature should make explicit that the presumption is in favor of pretrial release in all cases. I think this is implicit in Humphrey, but I think making it explicit could make an enormous difference. Second, there should be a zero bail schedule as a presumption. As you know, I think California State Senator Nancy Skinner opposed this on an emergency basis, creating a zero bail schedule during the time of COVID. It passed the California Senate, but it didn't pass the legislature and didn't get adopted. As you know, bail schedules have an enormous effect in the way bail actually gets set. Creating a zero bail schedule as a presumption could help in this regard. Third, the California legislature and the California Supreme Court need to clarify when pretrial detention is permitted in California. Footnote seven in the Humphrey case made clear that the California Supreme Court was not resolving that so it certainly gave an indication about it. I think the problem is that the categories that are identified by the California Supreme Court, public safety, victim safety, assuring the appearance of the defendant just gives too much latitude to courts. And thus, I think it's reflected in Humphrey not having any effect. Certainly an alternative to this would be the kind of risk assessment that was described in New Jersey though always with the caution that any risk assessment or algorithm needs to be very carefully done to not build in racial biases. Fourth, the California Supreme Court needs to resolve the tension between two provisions of the California Constitution. I think there is a tension between Article 1, Section 12, and Article 1, Section 28, F3. And I think only the California Supreme Court can resolve this tension so certainly this commission can make a recommendation to it. Whereas Article 1, Section 12 limits the ability to hold a person pretrial and certainly supports the decision in Humphrey, 
Article 1, Section 28, F3, does say that risk to the victim, to public safety, should be used. Um, I think there's a difference in the evidentiary standards. I think that the California Supreme Court in Humphrey is using a clear and convincing evidence standard, whereas I think the standard under 28F3 is a preponderance of the evidence standard. I think one way for the California Supreme Court to resolve this is by relying on the United States Constitution. I think that due process and equal protection, as I alluded to, were key to the Humphrey decision. I think it's relying on earlier cases that Justice Cuellar cites, like Bearden versus Georgia and United States versus Salerno. And if it could be argued that on the United States Constitution is the basis for Humphrey, then that, of course, takes precedence over 28F3. I think another way of reconciling this would be to interpret 28F3 narrowly in terms of the circumstances where it applies. And by interpreting it narrowly, we minimize the conflict with Article 1, Section 12. Fifth, I think it's essential that there be gathering of accurate data in terms of who is held and for how long and why they're held with regard to bail. I think one of the reasons that the study that is being presented to you, the coming up short report is so important is it presents that data. But Humphrey by itself doesn't mandate and can't make the gathering of that data. This commission can recommend it. The California legislature can require it. So conclusion, Humphrey offers enormous promise, but I think it will take further action and recommendations of the commission to make that promise a reality. Thank you, thank you both. This is super helpful as we start to dig into this. Um, committee members, do you have questions? All right, let me let me dig in. Um, Chief Justice Rabner, I was wondering if you could, for a minute, um, we're not super familiar with, with New Jersey politics. I expect that you're not super familiar with what's been going on out here, although it is a hugely contentious issue in California. And, you know, uh, I'm familiar to some degree with what's been going on in New York. Um, can you walk us through how bail reform became a reality in Cal in New Jersey. Um, and as you alluded to, it was, you know, I think Chris Christie was governor at the time. And how did this not become such a flashpoint in New Jersey? Or maybe it has become and was, uh, seems to be you've had great success without, without the politics that seems to be difficult, at least out here. So it began with a recommendation by then Governor Christie in favor of adopting, changing the constitution to allow for pretrial detention and only that. Um, the legislature uh, was controlled and just, by- Sorry, to, just to interrupt here. By only that meaning eliminating cash bail altogether? No, the, making, the recommendation was for only one change and had nothing to do with cash bail to expand the options that a judge had available oh. by empowering judges to detain on the basis of danger, which did not exist under the prior version of the Constitution. Um, that did not prevail. The Democratic-controlled legislature was not interested in that. There were more voices that were concerned about how to address the question of cash bail. Um, the judiciary set up a committee inviting representatives of all three branches, um, stakeholders, the ACLU, wardens, prosecutors, defense attorneys, attorney general, public defender, more than 30 individuals to join for a series of discussions. Um, I chaired the committee. It was a bit of a safe haven in that we didn't have cameras. We didn't have uh, anything other than the ability to have honest conversations back and forth. And by broadening the discussion to go beyond the question of dangerousness and pretrial detention, but to also discuss release for those who could not afford to make bail, we were able to achieve buy-in on the side of the defense bar and the public defenders as well as prosecutors who favored the governor's recommendation. And that committee, after about six months of work, came out with 27 recommendations. And this was a group that, no surprise, does not see eye to eye on many issues. Nearly all of them were unanimous, and, and a number were adopted, including the critical ones that we recommended, that, that I've covered earlier with you. So let me make sure I understand this correctly. So um, New Jersey, at the time, had no way to detain somebody for purely for dangerousness. 
And the sort of compromise, let's say, that was reached was a new, was it part of the constitution or a statute or I guess not really germane, but that a system that could both attain for dangerousness, but then would eliminate or at least dramatically reduce money bail. Is that the? That's right. The first uh -huh. change depended upon a change to the constitution. The second was by statute and by training judges um, to approach the system of pretrial release in a very different way than they had been. Interesting. Um, Dean Chemerinsky, I wanted to unpack a little bit two of the recommendations that you had. You, you said that there should be a presumption in favor of pretrial release. And I presume that you mean that without money bail, but perhaps other conditions. Um, I'm just curious of what your thought was there and would apply to everyone. And what's the difference between that and your suggestion of a, a zero bail presumption? Um, in terms of your first question, um, yes, what I meant by that was to make explicit that there is a presumption for release without money bail. Um, I think that's implicit in the Humphrey case, but I would recommend it made explicit. One way of carrying that out was to create a bail schedule that has a zero bail. Um, all of you know so well how much bail schedules influence the way in which judges actually set bail. And yet what hasn't happened is the revision of those bail schedules in light of the Humphrey decision. And I think having a zero bail schedule, there is a way of carrying out the presumption. Zero bail for everything. So not really a schedule, right? Just a presumption of zero bail. Presumption, right. And I think that the Humphrey case makes clear that under the California constitution, it is a rebuttable presumption but if Humphrey has meaning, it still has to be a strong presumption for zero bail. And that's what I think having a formal zero bail schedule could do. And uh, you'd have this set by judges at arraignment, I suppose. That's right. Yeah. Um, one of the concerns that I think we'll hear about later is the period of time, and perhaps both of you can, can address this. I think Justice uh, Ravner, you said that the bail conditions are set within 48 hours of arrest. And in, yes. and in California with some with exceptions, arraignment is in within 48 hours. So in San Francisco, uh, bail schedule was deemed unconstitutional by the federal court for some of the reasons that you discussed, Chem Chief, uh, excuse me, Dean Chemerinsky. Um, and um, my understanding of what happened in San Francisco was actually the schedules were kind of helpful because they allowed people immediately upon arrest to be able to post bond and post bail and, and get out very quickly, quicker than the 48 hours. And instead, in San Francisco, what I think is that they are now having some sort of evaluation and um, pretrial services gets involved. And therefore, it takes more time actually to get out from behind bars than having um, the schedule, as arbitrary and unconstitutional as the schedule may be, it's actually letting people out of from behind bars quicker. Uh, I guess let's start with Justice Rabner. How do you deal with the, the first 48 hours, which I understand also is the primary time, at least in California, if you're going to get out on bail, that that's really when you do get out, it's in those 48 hours. So I was wondering if your group addressed those first 48 hours um, in sure. particular. Sure, the statute requires 48 hours. We have set as our goal 24 hours. And during that period of time, pretrial services officers will do an assessment. They will look to the ordinary factors that one would expect to be considered about a person's record, about their record of failures to appear, um, age, whether they were out on release, a variety of common sense factors that, that no one would dispute belong as part of the analysis. And then the person's brought into court and there's pretrial there's a public safety assessment presented to the judge for cases where there's a serious risk. A motion for detention is made, and that person has a hearing within three days, which can be extended. But most, the vast majority, are released within that 24 or 24 hour plus period. But I would suggest you look at one additional thing, a trend that we um, were didn't anticipate, um, but that has been notable. And that is the number of cases. Um, that are no longer being addressed through arrest warrants. 
Instead, police officers who have the ability to run the PSA, to run um, the analysis and predict what a judge would do in advance, um, have now proceeded in, in large measure by summons, where the individual receives a piece of paper and is told when to appear in court, and they're not arrested. We've seen a third of the overall body of arrest warrants reduced in favor of summonses, and that reflects, as I said, the ability of law enforcement to predict what will happen in court, um, and beyond that, an earlier focus on the strength of a case in a conversation with the prosecutor that has separated out weaker cases or cases that should be resolved by summons. Um, but just th thank you, that's super helpful and interesting. Uh, just to clarify, though, in New Jersey, if you are if you are arrested, um, you are not able to be released, no matter how much bail you post or whatever, until that assessment, until you go before a judge, and that's twenty four to forty eight hours. Correct. And I assume judges work on weekends. We have we have court operational remotely on weekends. And has that always been the case, or was that part of the new bail reform? Um, that was part of the new bail reform. I got it. Uh, Dean Chemerinsky, I was wondering if you could address this 48 hour period, particularly with the schedules and I mean, perhaps the New Jersey model is good, although that means holding people for at least 24 hours, which is a significant amount of time. And at least in San Francisco, it seems that people were bailing themselves out within that period of time. Humphrey says that a person can be held if they're a danger to the community, a danger to the victim or serious flight risk. At least to the first two, I think we could identify categories of nonviolent offenders where there could be a strong presumption of the release prior to the court hearing. And so I think the way in which I would address your question is categorically in terms of just saying there are a whole category of offenses that don't involve the first two. And I think in terms of the latter, everything we know about release on recognizance is that's not likely to be a substantial problem in this category of cases. Um, you're right that that doesn't include cases where there is potential danger to public or danger to victim, but those are the cases where I do think there's no alternative but to have a judicial determination. Right, I think one of the conundrums I have here though is that the dangers to the public and danger to failure to return don't always correspond to the seriousness of the crime. So sometimes the least serious crimes have the lowest return rates or the most likely to be rearrested for a new crime, whereas the most serious crimes are, you know, the opposite. So would you focus on future danger or on the, on the severity of the offense? Because they don't necessarily correspond. I would focus on, as I think Humphrey does, danger to the public or danger to the victim. And I think there it is a distinction between violent and nonviolent crimes, though I'm overgeneralizing. And I think that the not returning, especially when you're doing nonviolent offenses, is much less important as a factor. Got it. I'm monopolizing the time here. And, and I know that we have a hard stop at 1030. So for this panel, does anybody else have any last questions? You know, I, I just have a, one observation on a point you raised, uh, Michael. And on something that uh, Michelle said about 23 hours in custody being sort of transformative. Uh, and that I've always felt that, a, you know, being arrested and being put into custody in county jail would transform at least most people I know. Uh, it is kind of a shock. So uh, two things, well, three things. One is uh, I wonder, I know we're looking at just pretrial uh, arrests and custody. Uh, I wonder to get the full picture, if we could ever get data on, you know, how many uh, arrestees are cited out by a local police department within a matter of hours. You know, they're, they're cited out of the police station basically without going to uh, county jail. Second, uh, I know that the city attorney, uh, you know, routinely just issues summons. I think Irwin just uh, referred to something like that, or I think maybe it was the Chief Justice, on just issuing a summons, mm -hmm. uh, basically letter notice, and seeing how that works. And uh, that would be one way of, of uh, I guess it's a, it's a way of citing out, but also just sending a letter for cases where the city attorney has been involved already. And, and third, I think we've all seen situations on uh, families panicking 
when someone has gotten arrested and they're in custody and they raise money. And as you say, people would rather just bail out right away before you know any kind of arraignment or appearance uh, in court. So that's something that has to we have to deal with. So there, I, I mean, I agree with Erwin that you know either a, a zero bail or very very low bail because that really puts a stress on a lot of families when you know a member of their family gets arrested and, and they just panic and unnecessarily so they pay the premium when if the uh, arrestee got a quick arraignment, he would probably be released OR at the, at the arraignment. And all of a sudden the family is out, the premium uh, and so forth. So, I mean, it's very, very complicated, but those are just the three observations I would have to kind of alternatives to, to zero bail, maybe lowering the bail schedule, having no bail schedule, uh, because that does have an impact on a judge's uh, frame of mind and, and setting bail. So. I think an exploration of all of those things that happened before an arraignment, you know, might yield some good results in the grand scheme of things. I know we have a hard stop here, so I'm going to I'm going to let um, Chief Justice and Dean Chemerinsky go. Uh, it's really a pleasure to see both of you. Thank you so much. Because no good deed goes unpunished, uh, you know, we'll probably be back in touch. Um, if you conversely, if you guys have thoughts or recommendations for us. Please, please um, let us know. We really appreciate your insights and your time today. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Nice to see you both. All right, Tom, are we ready for our next presentation? Yes, we are. Okay, great. Um, this is like drinking from a fire hose today. I really appreciate everybody's time and attention. Do we have 22 speakers? I thought we only had 11. Maybe, or did we get an agenda? <laughs> it's an um, agenda. Just, just, hold, just, just, just buckle in. <laughs> all right. I, mean, I, I thought we had 11, now it's 22. Um, uh, good morning, Professor Smith. Um, our next presentation is from Sandra Smith, the Daniel and Florence Guggenheim Professor of Criminal Justice at Harvard Kennedy School and the Director of the Malcolm Weiner Center for Social Policy at Harvard. Um, Professor Smith will present to the committee for about eight minutes and then we'll turn to Q&A again. Professor Smith, welcome to California. Thank you so much. It's good to be back, um, remotely at least. Um, I, I do not have the ability to share my screen, um, so can someone give me that permission? Let me okay, I, let I, try it again. It yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Not a problem. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm assuming everyone can see clearly. So um, thanks, uh, thank you very much. Sorry, for... sorry, Professor. We can also see your your notes. I don't know if that um, if you're okay with that. We're we're okay with that. I just wanted to point that out before you yeah. you got underway. <laughs> Let me see if I can fix this. Then. I think you were in presenter mode. Um, yeah. No problem. So now I've eaten up a good one minute of my eight minutes. Um, <laughs> so not a good way to use my time. So I just wanted to take a moment to share how I came to this space. So while I was still a professor at um, Berkeley, I um, had the good fortune of being a participant on an executive session at Harvard Kennedy School. It was on community corrections. And one of the presentations that uh, uh, that was given was on this question about the impact of uh, pretrial detention. It was one of the earliest studies, as far as I understand, that looked at how pretrial detention affect future um, criminal legal system involvement and also um, F rates of FTA. Um, and what we learned in that space was that spending any more than a day or two in, in pretrial uh, detention could dramatically increase the likelihood that one would have future criminal legal system involvement. I think from going from one to two days, it increased by 40% and it kept increasing beyond that. And this is the first I'd ever heard any such thing. At the time, I was a scholar of social capital and social networks looking at the Black poor and um, issues of joblessness. And this question or this, this uh, kind of insight um, that 
that pretrial detention dramatically increases the likelihood of future criminal um, system involvement, and especially so for low risk defendants, it just was jarring to me. I couldn't figure it out. I literally couldn't sleep the night, the, that night trying to figure out what happens in the context of one or two days in jail, which gets to the question or the, the point made earlier by um, Justice Moreno about the transformative effect of spending any time in, in, in jail, even a very short period of time. And so what we learn is that being held um, beyond one or two days increases the person's chances of being arrested and charged again. It um, increases the FTA rates. The longer one stint in detention, the greater the odds of new criminal contact or a new criminal complaint. And also, um, as I suggested earlier, that this uh, th these effects were the most pronounced for low risk defendants, the people who are least likely to have future co contact with a criminal legal system if we just let them go. Um, and so it it essentially shifted my focus, my research focus. I went from looking at questions of persistent joblessness to really trying to tackle or understand better what was happening in the in the in the context of the front end of criminal case processing, generally speaking, but pretrial detention systems um, um, in particular, to better understand what what the mechanisms were that were linking um, even just a day in detention, two days in detention, to these strike, striking kind of um, um, poor outcomes. Um, I started by thinking about what it meant in terms of penal system outcomes, but then it became very clear that pretrial detention not only has impacts on um, outcomes with regards to the penal system, but also with regards to socio so social and economic out outcomes as well. Um, and quickly, very quickly, what I became what I became aware of is based on research that had been done, and then my own research that emerged over the next uh, essentially five to seven years, that pretrial detention's harms are far greater than most realize, um, unfold far more quickly than most imagine, last for longer the impacts um, than most would guess, and far outweigh detention's benefits for the overwhelming majority of people who are held pretrial. The research that I conducted was based on in-depth interviews and some ethnographic field work, primarily in the San Francisco Bay Area. So my team of researchers and I um, uh, um, uh, interview people who had been arrested on low level of, of nonviolent offenses and um, um, in some cases had spent uh, upwards a few of uh, a few hours in jail upwards to a few weeks or so but the overwhelming majority of the people that I interviewed were people who were in um, capacitated for essentially less than a week. So I was really interested in what happened in those first few hours to few days that had an impact on people's experiences. And what I'm about to share is of no surprise to anyone. Um, my research shows that among the people that I interviewed who had uh, who spent time in detention, uh, over 40% missed work, or, or roughly a fifth lost their jobs as a result of missing work. 12% um, lost their vehicles. Many lost their vehicles at the point of arrest and then were released a few days later. And so they couldn't afford to get their, their cars released and so lost their cars um, after that. Some lost their cars because they had been away for so long that they'd been towed and they couldn't afford to, to get it out of um, car storage. They lost property, including money. Much of that was related to being released from uh, from jail and not being given back the property that they had um, submitted when they were admitted. They lost the opportunities for mobility. Um, five, six percent of my respondents lost custody of their children. This was related to detention, not the arrest itself. Um, they missed um, rent and lost housing. Some were enrolled in school or educational programs, training programs, they missed key exams or tests. And so they um, either um, failed those courses or they had to drop out altogether. And not surprisingly, there was huge neg negative effect on individuals' mental and emotional health and well-being. And the focus here is really about what I try to get people to think about is what would happen, could you imagine what would happen if all of a sudden you were pulled out of your life for three days or so without any expectation that this was gonna happen and without any um, um, uh, time to kind of adjust to the fact that you were not gonna be in your life, right? And so people are faced with these circumstances where they are pulled out of their lives and completely lose control of what is happening. And because those who are arrested and detained are people who are most precarious, they have the least amount of resources in order to address this. Um, so incapacitation ends up leading to a domino effect of losses that many have a really difficult time recovering from. 
Um, and so that's just about what happens when you're when you're pulled out of your life, uh, kind of out of um, uh, in a way that is unexpected um, and that you're not prepared to deal with. But there's also the question of the harsh conditions of confinement. Now we're talking about San Francisco County jails, and so these are in in one could easily argue better than most jails in the state of California and frankly across the, the country. And yet a significant minority um, of my respondents reported excessive heat or, or, um, or cold, mostly the excessive cold, but also excessive heat to some extent. Filthy conditions, they could neither take care of their own bodies nor did they feel comfortable in the environment that they were made to live. Food was insufficient. Um, um, food and water were insufficient and poor, such that a significant minority just didn't eat at all. They, they basically waited until they left. Some reported losing 15, 20 pounds um, during the process. Arbitrary, rigid, odd schedule, with, which left them feeling like completely unmoored, poor access to health care, poor access to other resources, many of those related to hygiene, limited out-of-time schedule, connected with mind-numbing boredom, um, meant that people just felt like they were losing their minds, and yet they had to be ready for violence um, or the, the threat of it at any moment, which happened fairly often, um, um, neglectful, um, hostile guards, and then a kind of institutional silence, which, which many of my respondents reported was the most difficult um, thing that they had to deal with, being held in detention without getting any sense about what, what they were being charged with, how long they were going to be held for, when they would be getting out, et cetera, no access to phones. Um, a significant minority reported that they were never given the opportunity to use the phones, that the rules around when they could use the phones were constrained, the phone system itself was complicated, and many, because they were going through a traumatic experience, couldn't even remember the numbers that they of the people that they cared most about and who they would have called, because, again, they were in a traumatic situation, so they, they um, were not able to call out. When I did these interviews, it was before um, um, San Francisco eliminated the cost for calls um, at the time you would have to pay if you were calling outside 15 miles. And for people who had to make those, um, those kinds of calls, it was too ex often too expensive. And so what this meant was that they had limited access to family members and friends, to legal counsel, and it made it really difficult for them to um, um, be able to uh, uh, um, deal with the, the, the trauma associated with having been arrested and being detained. And they also complained about the delayed in, uh, delays in the release process where um, they were told that they would be released, if, but the release wouldn't happen for 12 hours or more. Um, and the conditions of release themselves were troubling. People were released in the middle of the night between 1 and 5 a.m. in the morning when transportation was no longer running. Often it was so cold and they were unable to, to um, to really kind of protect themselves from the elements. And they were also, again, released um, after having some of their items stolen or lost. And so they often didn't have phones or money in order to be able to get out, um, to, get, to get back home. Um, and so there are multiple issues. These issues related both to incapacitation and what that did in terms of making it so that they could not deal with the responsibilities of their lives and the conditions of confinement led to a series of kind of emotional um, responses um, that people took with them once they left detention. Um, over their time in, in that, uh, over their time in detention, anxiety and stress um, and also shame and guilt grew um, consistent throughout their length of detention, feelings of anger and frustration, not surprisingly fear and intimidation, mostly related to the, the threat of violence. Um, 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 misery, um, a feeling of neglect and abandonment, um, and this was especially acute for those folks who had um, mental health or, or other kinds of issues that needed to be attended to and they weren't getting serviced, uh, a sense of power, powerlessness and helplessness, and then sadness and depression. Um, what declined over time was a kind of shock and confusion, which was greatest um, um, in the first few hours today, and then kind of declined over time as people became kind of more more adjusted to the situation. So we're figuring out ways to, to manage in a really difficult situation. Um, but I bring these up because these are feelings that left that they left um, the jails with when they were when they were finally released. 
Um, and as we know from, from um, a lot of research that's emerged over the past five to seven years, I say predominantly, um, there are many short and long-term collateral consequences associated with having been um, detained. There are increases in the burden of legal financial obligations. We often talk in terms of fines and fees here related to the courts, but one of the big things that my respondents um, shared with me was that this was less about the fines and fees than about the money they paid to bail themselves out. Most had to take out some kind of loan in order to be able to do that, but they were already in a precarious enough situation that those loans then really kind of weighed them down for many um, years to come. I interviewed people three years after their pretrial experience, and the bulk of the people that I interviewed who took out loans in order to be able to re be released so that they could get back to work and take care of their kids, um, et cetera, were people who were still trying to pay down those loans and who were often not paying other bills because they could not afford to. Um, the, the, the burden um, associated with um, bail was or paying bail or getting loaned on getting loans to be able to pay bail became too much. People experienced diminished physical and psychological well-being. Um, experiencing detention depresses labor market participation, employment, wages, and um, annual earnings. It strains social relationships and increases um, social isolation over time. This is one of the um, findings um, that I that is becoming very apparent and has long-standing or long-term effects. Um, and as we described earlier, as I described earlier, increases the likelihood of conviction on current charges leads to more severe sentences um, if you're detained um, and also increases the likelihood of future penal system involvement. Um, what my research is revealing at this point, um, and these results are still uh, tentative, is that um, there's a certain set of collateral consequences that seem to be related to future penal system involvement. You lose your house, you lose your job, you accumulate debt, that seems to set you up or increase the risk that you will have future criminal legal system involvement. Those who end up social, um, isolating themselves socially, either because of shame um, or because they feel like there's something about their social uh, group that is making them or creating a greater risk for them to be um, um, have, to have contact with the criminal legal system. Those are the folks who are removing themselves from those uh, social relationships, becoming isolated, but then also increasing the risk of future penal system involvement, those who lacked um, access to health care while they were in jail, who experienced violence and intimidation, and then there were also a set of emotional responses, the shame and guilt, the feeling of powerlessness and helplessness, neglect and abandonment, misery, anger and frustration, these all seem to be related to future penal system involvement later on down the line. Uh, based on what it is that I'm, uh, I'm learning from the research that I've been doing, um, but also from research that has been done over the last, again, five to seven years. You know, I, I, there are a set of, of uh, recommendations that we could put forward. The usual suspects are to identify the specific issues within the context of the jail and, and address those, improve the food quality, which San Francisco has tried to do, improve access to health care, again, something that San Francisco has tried to do, improve sanitation standards, greater access to friends and family members for support, um, greater access to healthy stimulation opportunities, and perhaps train um, corrections officers and pr procedural justice techniques, since one of the major issues that my respondents had was the, this question of how um, um, hostile and uh, abusive um, guards could be. Um, but such reforms really would only treat the symptoms of a dehumanizing system and wouldn't um, actually do much to change the overall system. And so I would suggest instead um, a set of uh, responses that I think are consistent with what I heard in the previous uh, from the pe previous panelists. Shift to citation in lieu of arrest for most nonviolent misdemeanor felonies. Give folks a ticket and tell them when to show up to jail, as a, I mean, when to show up to court, uh, as opposed to sending them to jail and having to deal with that process. Provide access to the pre-arraignment council. My understanding um, when I was still in California was that the San Francisco Public Defender's Office um, offered a, a pre-trial release unit where they focused on felony uh, folks who've been arrested for felony offenses and gave them a whole host of pre-arraignment um, support that dramatically reduced um, the number of people 
um, who were held pre-trial and also increase the number whose cases were dismissed. Um, we could probably deal with a lot of even serious cases um, in this way. Abolish ca cash bail altogether, and to the extent we rely on detention at any at all, it is for those cases that represent an imminent threat of violence or a clear risk of uh, or clear flight risk. Um, this means implementing a presumption of release for most um, cases. Um, um, and then don't replace um, a reliance on pretrial detention with a reliance on pretrial electronic monitoring of a new paper out that speaks to the issues of pretrial electronic monitoring in the San Francisco um, context. Um, instead, deploy the least restrictive conditions necessary to reduce um, the risk of harm during the pretrial period period. Now, of course, with these recommendations, the question is, does a pretrial release harm public safety itself? And what we're learning based on rigorously conducted studies over the the past just a couple years is, it, uh, is that um, there's actually really uh, relatively little evidence to support this idea that pretrial release increases the threats to public safety than we would have at baseline. Um, here's a, a kind of a summary of the, the studies that have been done in different contexts. Um, not all of them clearly, but different contexts across the country. And what you see here are increases or decreases in rearrest rates after pretrial reforms. What I should point out, though, is in each of these cases, the differences that were um, reported were not statistically significant. So even in cases where in Kentucky, where there's been reported one to two percent increase in rearrest, re re the author makes it very clear that this is statistically insignificant and is likely the result of either noise or some other factor. And we find that across the board. And so what this suggests is that there's very little difference in rearrest rates after pretrial reforms than before. And we're seeing this in multiple contexts across the country. Um, what about increases in violent crime, which we should be, which we many are more uh, uh, concerned about, um, and understandably so, uh, that a handful of impact evaluations have examined this association. Um, and here too, they found no statistically significant relationship between bail reform um, and the rate of new violent felony charges um, among people who are released pretrial. Um, this is just one example of a, of a well-conducted study that's looked at this question. Megan Stevenson's 2018 report focused on the K Kentucky context, well, even where we see small upticks in FTA rates and just a tiny blip um, in increase in uh, pretrial rearrest. Again, neither statistically significant. There's barely a movement with regards to violent um, arrest pretrial. Um, and that's in part because it's violent, uh, um, arre violent arrest generally, or rearrest generally speaking, happen at such a low rate. Um, but what happens with regards to these extra releases doesn't really um, um, budge that number very much at all. Um, and so th there seems to be little reason for why we would hold on to practices that continue to harm not just the individuals who are um, being brought into the system, but the families and the communities that they're a part of, um, we would be much better off um, based on the body of research that's developed so far to release the overwhelming majority of people, um, um, even if there are some ways that we supervise those that we find most um, who, who might, might be at greater risk of, of engaging in harmful behaviors. Um, Pre-trial detention um, should be used for the, the very kind of most dangerous and highest risk um, 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 folks um, than, than the vast majority, well, so many of the people that we bring into the system. I will end there, probably went way over my time, but um, thank you for your patience and having me get through this. No, thank you. That was very interesting. Uh, lots of information there. And I know that your written submission also includes some extra data that I think will be helpful to the committee. I have a quick question and um, then I, you know, we have a we have to move on at 11. So uh, if anybody has any questions, other questions, Professor Smith, we hear a lot about no increase in uh, re-arrest or new, new arrest rate, right? But if we're releasing more people and have the same arrest rate, then we do have more, assuming that arrests correspond roughly with criminal activity, which I'll just put that aside for a second, that we do have more crimes being committed, right? If we release more people pre-trial, um, I don't. So when we're talking about the um, uh, when we're asking a question about rearrest rates, um, 
post reforms, um, post any movement um, to release folks. We're comparing it to what existed before that, um, before the policy shift or whatever kind of shift um, happens with regards to criminal legal system intervention. And what many reports are finding is that there is not a great increase in, um, it, it's minor at best and not statistically significant. Why would that be? That's in part because we are detaining a lot of people who would not be committing crimes if they were just let out. So if a concentration of folks that you are holding are not people who would have been, who they, they're essentially, I mean, we were making this point, they're essentially being held because they can't afford to get out. If that is the reason why they're being held, not because they're actually dangerous, when you release them, you're releasing a, a bulk of people who are not likely to commit a new crime. Pre right. I, I, again, and, and maybe my math is wrong, but I, the, the, the math doesn't add up. If we're releasing a bunch of people who are at zero danger to public safety and we're greatly ex expanding their opportunities for release, then the overall rate should go down because right there's more, there's more people in the denominator. So I guess what I'm asking is, if we released 100 people and we had a re-arrest rate of 10%, right? And then we released 1,000 released people, but our re-arrest rate was also, was, remained 10%, the amount of crime committed by people who've been released by the jail system is still 10 times higher. Isn't that the, the amount of crime that's happening yes. in the community? You could still not, be at 10%. Not the rate. I'm not, I'm, yeah, the I'm rate. not sure why, we, why you would be much higher than 10% if the folks that you're elite releasing are either are similar in some way or even out. So you might be releasing some people might be more likely to engage in criminal or get caught up with the system and then those who are less likely. No, I guess here, so... Somebody jump in if my math is wrong. If you release 100 people with a 10% arrest rate, 10 people will be rearrested, right? Right. If you release 1,000 people, then 100 people will be rearrested. Right. So by the, and I'm saying that the reform is the, now letting out 1,000 people. So now you have a, 100 crimes rather than 10. So there's 90 more crimes. The rate of rearrest of the, on the 1,000 people remains the same, 10%, but you still have more crimes in the community. And I was just, I'm not, I'm just wondering if, if my math is correct, meaning there's more crimes in the community, even though the rate remains the same. And if so, like, how do we address that concern? So, so you're, what's embedded in what you just described is an assumption that the folks that who, who are being released are engaging in, are either being treated by the criminal legal system, because not everybody who gets arrested has actually committed a crime. Many people don't. Um, right, no, I was just trying to keep it apples to apples about the re-arrest rates remaining the same. That, that actually might be a problem to the extent that the folks who are being released don't, the, the assumptions that you're making might be a little off. If, if it is the case that we have been holding people who are likely or le maybe even less likely to commit some crimes, and maybe there's a subset of folks who are more likely to, I'm not sure that you would expect to have a, 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 an increase in the crime rate, because that's what you're talking about. As a no, no, I'm not talking about crime rate. I'm talking about overall amount of crime in the community, right? You have 90 more. And Okay, well, sorry. Uh, okay. So I, I, I can't speak to the actual numbers of, of cases that come forward. All I can speak to are rearrest rates um, and crime rates, which I think many studies have spoken to and do find that there's no statistically significant increase um, in, in those rates when we move from one to the next. And I think it's because the composition of the folks who are being brought in and let out um, it is, is shifting um, over time. And those folks, the propensity to engage in criminal activity and also the propensity to be responded to by the criminal legal system shifts with that composition. Got it. Thank you. Um, do other folks have questions? Because I can keep on going as usual. So I was wondering, Professor Smith, if you dealt with this conundrum that's, I think, particular to San Francisco that I alluded to in the prior, I don't know if you were able to hear it with the prior panel, right, where federal court eliminated um, cash, uh, excuse me, the bail schedule in San Francisco, right? And that actually created this problem where um, people who were able to bail themselves out quickly were all of a sudden prevented from bailing themselves out and then had to wait in jail longer than they would have otherwise only to be released by a judge. How, how do we address that problem? Because I, I was very impressed and I think that we're all impressed by this idea that the first 24 to 48 hours are super critical 
And um, if our arraignment system in California is 48 hours, then how do, how do we deal with this, 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 this issue? Um, so one of my recommendations was to um, in, increase the um, extent to which we rely on citation in lieu of arrest so that you're not bringing in a vast majority of folks who do who are being kind of made accountable for what the the what police are saying that they've done. So I think that that would be one way to address it. It just it just moves the 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 situation to the courts as opposed to bring them into jail. The other might be to engage in what I think is happening in Harris County, Texas, where I think it's a 24 hour period. So that's you you they're moving a lot faster to get people out. Out. Um, and if a determination hasn't been made after, if it's not 24 hours, it might be 36, they automatically release, period. Um, and so, so the system moves, it's, it, it's set up now to move much faster. And again, this is for um, folks in the misdemeanor category, because that's where the, I think their bail reforms are focused on. So I think two major uh, um, changes that can be made is really relying much more heavily on citation in lieu of release that avoids jail for those folks altogether. And then um, to put into place a, a deadline by which folks have to be released um, um, under most circumstances. Um, and that would be triggered at 24 hours, perhaps 36 hours at the most. Um, but I do think it's important to get folks out um, as quickly as possible so that they don't begin to experience the, 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 uh, the downsides of having that much um, time in, in detention. And then finally, I want to ask you something that I, again, I came up in an earlier presentation. I just wanted to hear your reflection on it, which is that um, it doesn't seem to me that that's the problem of really making bail. It's the problem of being able to pay the 10% surety, right? Most people come back, so they wouldn't lose the $100,000 bail or whatever it might be. So I guess my question is, how would you react to a system in California where courts could be offer um, court back sureties, meaning like no premium. And I guess this is how it works in the federal system, as Justice Moreno had said. Although you, you know, you are, uh, you know, you do owe $100,000 or whatever it is, if you don't show up. Do you think that that would have a significant improvement? Um, significant improvement in, in terms of what? Well, we're talking the, out the, outcomes, the outcomes that we care about, which is people not being held purely because they're poor, not having the racial disparities, not having the increased criminal activity, not having all the detrimental effects that you enumerated. Yeah, like I, I think it does. It, it would help with a number of those. One, Some of the research that's emerging now, though, suggests that... Uh, um, no, I think that I think I think that you're absolutely right. I think it would it would make a huge difference in terms of people's ability to to get out quickly um, um, and to not have to suffer under some of the the um, constraints and um, limitations that happen when they are being made to either pay that ten percent um, or wait um, so, until they can be released on their own recognizance. So I think that that would be good. I've just been um, thinking about uh, the implications of some new research that suggests that um, how ineffective in general cash um, bail can be um, in terms of having people return or not engage in new crime. Um, and so th there's a whole question about whether this whole system is is as effective as we assume that it is in terms of making it so that people do show up and that they do uh, um, avoid behaviors that might get them caught up in the system again. Oh, I share your, your skepticism about that as well. Um, the problem that we have here in California is that we have Proposition 25, which right was a referendum on the elimination of cash bail, and then we can't eliminate cash bail again without another ballot measure. So it makes it just hard to yeah. very logistically politically difficult to to achieve the zero bail um idea all right thank you so much i really thank appreciate you your much. submission all the data and your and and having you thank you coming from all the way from boston to california i really appreciate it uh, thank you so much all for right. having me. good luck thank you so mike um, uh we were we're going a little behind, so we, you know, we could sort of our next panel was supposed to start at eleven, but um, we haven't taken a break. I don't know if you all want to take maybe a short three or four minute break and and come back. I think that would work with our panelists, or we could get through this one, take a break, whatever you all want to do. I just wanted to put that on the table. <laughs> all right, should we take should we take a five minute break, everyone? Uh, yes. 
All right, we'll be back at 11.07. Thanks, everyone.